Вой поля, вой поля, вы широкие. In 1932 to 1933, Joseph Stalin, the dictator of the Soviet Union, starved to death millions of Ukrainians in the genocide famine known today as the Holodomor. It was kept hidden from the world. This is how Stalin got away with one of history's best kept secrets. Thank God I didn't kill anyone. I didn't have anyone put away. I yelled and begged and swore and threatened, of course. Anyone who doesn't bring in grain had better watch out for the punishing sword of the proletarian dictatorship. Why is it to this day that most people have not heard of the Holodomor? The Holodomor was one of the largest genocides of uh, the 20th century. I think it takes on special significance uh, because it was so long not recognized and was certainly denied by the Soviet government. Holodomor uh, is a Ukrainian word that means death famine. It was not the product of weather, it was not the product of accident, it was created for political reasons uh, in order to ensure that the Ukrainian peasantry and the Ukrainian intelligentsia didn't become a political problem for Stalin. Stalin sought through the famine to impose his control on Ukraine. Without Ukraine, there is no USSR. Uh, Ukraine was known as the breadbasket of Europe because it was the center of grain production originally in the Russian Empire, um, but also within Europe itself. Um, most of Russia's grain export came from the black earth lands of Ukraine. It's the biggest republic other than Russia. It was the one that was closest to Europe. It was the one that was most European culturally and economically. And Russia simply, without Ukraine, is a faraway northern country. And it didn't have the kind of power and the kind of presence in European politics without Ukraine. The Ukrainian peasants didn't want to have anything to do with collectivization and fought it. And they fought it much harder than anyone else did. And there were outright battles. I mean, we're talking hundreds of uprisings in 1929-1930, where Ukrainian peasants, you know, essentially said, we're not going to have anything to do with your collective farms. Ukraine had lost its fight for independence after the Russian Revolution, yet gained some cultural freedom under the Soviets, at first. There was an increasing attention to Ukrainian national thinking and national distinctiveness within the Soviet Union uh, at the end of the 20s and beginning of the 30s. And this too angered uh, Stalin and the people in the Soviet leadership to the point where uh, they wanted to bring Ukraine under control and make it a Soviet possession, just like all the other republics of the Soviet Union. The leaders of the Soviet Union are trying to remake the world, and one of their central ideas is that they understand the future. The future will damage what they do now. Certain people who are around now essentially have no purpose. And this idea is tested, I think, most dramatically in Ukraine. And Ukraine, because it's the most fertile territory of the Soviet Union, is where um, the hammer hits hardest. Stalin's trusted envoy, Pavel Postashev, is given sweeping dictatorial powers and sent into Ukraine with an army of secret police to purge the Ukrainian party ranks and to squeeze out the last kernels of grain. 112,000 trusted party members from Russia are now stationed in Ukraine. They guard the standing crops and livestock from the starving, brutally enforcing the law to protect state property. Finally, the starvation tactics that were designed to eliminate the problem of Ukrainian nationalism and Ukrainian peasant rebellion forever. The schools were more or less Russified. All the dictionaries were removed and changed so that the language became closer to Russian. Major Ukrainian communist leaders were either put in jail or forced to commit suicide, major intellectual committed suicide. So this was a tragic blow to the Ukrainian peasantry and to the Ukrainian culture and elite. Remember, it took place in more or less five to six months. Ukraine is literally 
decimated, the population is devastated, and through that, the culture, the language, the institutions, and everything else. Teams of people came into Ukraine and went village by village and removed the food from people's houses. Apples, beets, uh, uh, they would lead away the cows, they would take away whatever was in storage. They passed passport laws that forbade Ukrainians to go, peasantry to go into the cities, um, and eventually they blocked the entire republic so people couldn't leave. The Soviet secret police seal off Ukraine's borders. No one can get out or bring food in. A nation the size of France is strangled by hunger. Stalin crushed the possibilities of Ukrainian autonomy, Ukrainian self-determination in some ways within the Soviet Union uh, through the actions taken in Holodomor. This was a, an attack across the board against Ukrainian nationality. It broke the ability of the society to resist for decades to come. There are many uh, really heartbreaking stories about what was happening there, but probably the ones that touched the most was when people who were really dying were helping others and helping neighbors and, and, and trying to save children and elderly while really starving themselves. Many of these policies were conducted by locals in the same villages, by neighbors who were doing that to their neighbors. You never stopped to be amazed about the strength of the human spirit, but also about the, the depth to which humans can really descend. At the height of the famine, in June 1933, people in Ukraine were dying at the rate of 28,000 per day. What is impressive is the success of the Soviet effort to control the news. We have now documents proving that they call journalists, they call uh, diplomats in Moscow and, you know, threaten at them of expulsion, of not allowing them to work anymore in the Soviet Union if they reveal the extent of the famine. In fact, the first serious a scholarly monograph book about the famine was published only in 1986 by Robert Conquest, 53 years after the fact. Journalist Gareth Jones risked his life to travel to Ukraine and report on the famine. There he interviewed survivors and Soviet agents. If any man, woman or child goes out into the field at night in the summer and picks a single ear of wheat, then the punishment according to law is death by shooting, the communists explained to me. Jones described what was known as the Law of the Five Ears of Wheat, signed by Mikhail Kalinin, head of the USSR Central Executive Committee, and Vyacheslav Molotov, head of the Council of People's Commissars, used judicial repressions of the highest degree as measures of social protection against theft of collective farm property, execution by shooting, and confiscation of all property. Although there is journalistic uh, writing on this period on it, there were also voices who wished to contradict that testimony. Of course, Walter Durante is the major case of a liar on these events. He was not only the greatest liar among the journalists in, in Moscow, but he was the greatest liar of any journalist that I've ever met in the 50 years of journalism. And we used to wonder whether, in fact, the authorities hadn't got some kind of hold over him because he so utterly played their game. But it didn't uh, worry the New York Times who featured his uh, reports. When it came to the famine, the great famine in the Ukraine brought about by collectivization, that was when his reporting was particularly disgraceful because he denied that there was any famine. As archived British Foreign Office documents show, in private discussions with Foreign Office staff, 
Durante stated that the famine had killed up to 10 million people. The Soviet authorities put pressure on journalists or gave them inducements uh, to tell the story very differently. And some of these journalists were then expelled by the Soviet authorities, such as Rhea Kleinman. People who did try to write about it, particularly outside of the USSR, um, were often accused of being right-wingers or working for the CIA. There was a kind of campaign that would be run against anybody who would try to describe this problem. They forced them into the lie. You're either going to lie along with us or you're going to be purged. Pizniejsze, że jak ja do szkoły zaczęła chodzić, wszystko mówczało. Nikto nic nie mówił, bo nie wolno było mówić. I mama wszystko każe, nic nie mówić. Mówczało, wszystko mówczało. You could not even uh, weep your death, mourn. This was forbidden. Actually, you had to say that everything was fine. You had to deny what you had seen. That your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your father, your mother, died of hunger under your own, you know, while you were watching, but you would not say this. So I think there were very deep psychological consequences. The, the hundreds or thousands of petitions, very often from children, you know, which are sent up with the thought, with the hope, the assumption that someone higher up is going to know, care, be able to do something about it. In many of the places where the famine was most devastating, uh, Russians were brought in uh, to replace Ukrainian villagers. In other words, the, the, the nature of the country changed after the famine. What happens in Ukraine, it wouldn't be wrong to see it as a kind of colonization. It was a horrible blow to um, Ukrainian national identity, social solidarity, political trust, um, from which I think it's fair to say Ukrainians are, are still recovering. It was only in the last years of the Soviet Union that the truth about the famine, about the number of victims and the causes of the famine became part of the public discourse. Study of the Holodomor, like the study of any great tragedy, is extremely important in order to understand the nature of the modern world, in order to understand how human beings think and act. We should study it as a terrible tragedy of the history of genocide, in the hopes again that people will not allow such things to recur. Some of the regions of Ukraine hit hardest by the genocide famine again suffer from Russian aggression. Like Stalin before him, Vladimir Putin denies that Ukraine is its own country. Stalin really didn't believe that Ukrainians had their own nation and nationality. What Putin's goals are in Ukraine, what he wants to accomplish, uh, some people think he simply wants to destabilize uh, Ukraine. Some people think he wants more territory. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has violated international law, including the Geneva Convention, the Charter of the United Nations, the Helsinki Accords, the Charter of the OSCE, the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, two Russia-Ukraine friendship treaties, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and numerous principles of the European Court of Human Rights. The situation in Ukraine is very destabilizing for the region and for Europe as a whole, for the world as a whole. The atrocities of the past matter as lessons for today. We are all citizens of a global village in a struggle between freedom and oppression, hope and fear, democracy and dictatorship. Ukraine's struggle to maintain its freedom and territorial integrity continues. Oh, yeah.